Our view of the philosophy of the ancient world is dominated by two figures, Plato and Aristotle. Plato is the first philosopher whose works have come down to us in the form in which he wrote them. Aristotle was one of his pupils. In fact, there's an extraordinary line of personal succession there, for just as Aristotle had been a pupil of Plato, so Plato had been a pupil of Socrates. In this program, we're going to look at Aristotle's work, whose greatness and influence rival those of any other philosophers. The son of a doctor, Aristotle was born in 384 BC, not in Athens, but he was sent to Athens to be educated. And at the age of 17, he became one of the pupils at Plato's academy. He stayed there for 20 years until the death of Plato in 347 BC. He was then uprooted and spent the next 12 years in political exile, a period in which he was primarily absorbed in biological researches, and even spent a short period as tutor to Alexander the Great. He then returned to Athens, and for another 12 years taught at a school which he founded himself, called the Lyceum. Then he went into exile again, but died only a year later, in 322 BC, at the age of 62. Only about one-fifth of Aristotle's work has survived, but even that fills 12 volumes and touches on the whole range of what was available knowledge in his time. Unfortunately, all those works which he prepared for publication and which were praised throughout antiquity for their great beauty of style have been lost. All we have is what he wrote up from lecture notes, so it has none of the literary art of what we have of Plato's writings. But even so, there can be no doubting the quality or the influence of the thought. Here to discuss it with me is someone who established a reputation very young in Aristotle scholarship, Professor Martha Nussbaum of Brown University in the United States. Professor Nussbaum, can you start by telling us something about the ground covered by Aristotle's output? Yes, we have here a philosophical achievement of tremendous range and complexity. We have fundamental work in all the sciences of his day, including especially the science of biology, where his contribution was unmatched for a thousand years. Then work in general foundations of scientific explanation, general philosophy of nature. Work in metaphysics, including questions of substance, identity, continuity. Work on life and the mental faculties. And finally, we have terrific work in ethics and political theory, and work in rhetoric and the theory of literature. It's an extraordinary fact, isn't it, that over this incomparable range, he was regarded as the authority for hundreds upon hundreds of years during the Middle Ages. Yes, and I think this actually gives us a great difficulty in approaching Aristotle's thought. We're so used to thinking of him, as you say, as an authority, as the philosopher, Dante's the master of those who know, sitting on his throne. And I think, actually, this prevents us from seeing that Aristotle is really one of the most flexible and open-ended of philosophers, one who views philosophy as an ongoing search to attend to all the complexities of human experience and who never rests content and, but is searching for ever more adequate ways to bring that complexity into his thought. Now, across the enormous range of his output, is there any one unifying factor or mode of approach that one can point to? Well, Aristotle tells us that in every area, the philosopher's got to begin by setting down what he calls the appearances then working through the puzzles that these present us with, and then coming back to them, saving, as he puts it, the greatest number and the most basic. To show you what this is, let me give you an example. Suppose you're a philosopher working on the problem of time. Now, what you'll do, according to Aristotle, is begin by setting down not only our perceptual experience concerning temporal succession and duration, but also our ordinary beliefs and what we say concerning time. You'll set all this down, then you'll see whether it presents you with any contradictions. And if you find contradictions there, then you'll go to work sifting and sorting out, and you'll try to see which of our beliefs are actually more basic than others, and you'll preserve those and then get rid of the ones that actually conflict with those, so that you come back in the end to ordinary discourse with increased structure and understanding. But time or anything else isn't the same thing as our belief about time or anything else. Does he make a clear distinction between the world and our discourse about the world. Well, here, his notion of appearances covers both our perceptual experience of the world and our ordinary sayings and beliefs. Now, it's a broad conception and one that admits of lots of further subdivisions, and certainly he's perfectly prepared to say that sometimes we will rely more on the experience of our senses and sometimes more on ordinary beliefs and sayings. But I think he's right to think that there's a general unifying notion here, because after all, our perception is interpretive, and selective, 
And it's a par part and parcel of our conceptual schemes and the ways that as human beings we make sense of the world. Isn't there a danger, though, that this approach might be flat-footed or pedestrian? Because, I mean, if he always starts from our experience, our perceptions, and takes off from that and always, so to speak, returns to it at the end, doesn't that mean that the whole of his philosophy is confined to the surface of the world of experience, when what we feel we actually want is more like what Plato gives us, something that gets behind the surfaces or below the surfaces to a deeper, more underlying level compared with which the surface is indeed superficial. Yes, I think you're right to bring in Plato here, and it's certainly true that for Plato and lots of the tradition that preceded Plato, the dominant image of philosophy is one of going behind or getting out there, walking to the rim of the universe and staring beyond at some transcendent reality that's above and beyond our experience. But actually, I think Aristotle would have two things to say about that. First of all, he would say that our experience is an object of tremendous wonder, richness, beauty in its own right. And then, second, he will say that actually we never can coherently go beyond our experience, that the only project that we can really undertake is the mapping, the investigating of the area of our experience. Now, let me give you an example of how he argues this point. And here, there's a fundamental principle in Aristotle's thought, which he calls the principle of non-contradiction. This is the principle that contradictory properties can't apply to the same subject at the same time in the same respect. For example, my dress cannot be both blue and not blue at the same time, in the same place, in the same respect, and so forth. Now, Aristotle says this is a very basic principle. It's so basic that we seem to use it whenever we think and speak. Now, how do we go about justifying such a fundamental principle, which is actually the most basic of all, as he puts it? Well, he tells us that we can't actually justify it from, without, from outside our experience, because, in fact, we use it in all our experience, in sorting out experience. But suppose that an opponent challenges it now. Now, Aristotle says at this point, you ask the opponent whether the opponent is prepared to say anything, anything definite at all. Now, suppose he doesn't say anything. Well, then Aristotle says you can dismiss that person because a person who doesn't say anything insofar as he doesn't say anything is pretty well like a vegetable. Well, now, suppose, on the other hand, the opponent does say something, and it's something definite. Then, says Aristotle, you can actually show that person that in saying anything definite at all, he or she is, in fact, making use of that very principle that the person is challenging. Because in asserting something definite, you've got to be at the same time ruling something out, at the very least the contradictory of what you've been asserting in the first place. It's easy to see how fundamental logical principles like this can be and indeed are inherent in all our discourse, but not how they could provide a, a foundation for the kind of knowledge it is that Aristotle is seeking. Well, I think Aristotle here is eager to say that we cannot provide for any principle a foundation that does stand altogether outside our discourse and our conceptual schemes. And he gives a further reason for this when he gives his general account of discourse. His general account says that we can designate in speech a thing only when it is actually impinged on the experience of one of us, somebody in our linguistic community. For example, he says, we can signal thunder in discourse only when somebody hears a noise in the clouds. And at that point, we're able to use the name thunder to refer to that noise. And then at that point, we can start asking, what is that thing there? What explains it? And we can go on to inquire more about what it is. But now suppose we tried to stand altogether outside of experience and find some entity or entities that actually had never entered the experience of any human being at all. Let's take, for example, Plato's forms. Now, Aristotle says, look here, Plato tries to hang philosophy on forms like the form of the white, which actually is imagined to be not the color of any real body at all, but just a white itself out there. Now that, he says, is actually meaningless nonsense talk. He says Plato's forms, in that sense, are like meaningless syllables you say to yourself when you're singing to yourself, because we can't actually talk about things that haven't entered our experience at all.